Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining us today is Jim the Rookie Morris, a best-selling author who had Dennis Quaid portray him in the very successful Disney film, The Rookie. Jim's life is an amazing journey that warranted major Hollywood studios fighting for the right to tell his story. Achieving what many said were impossible feats over and over is what Jim has done throughout his life. Overcoming an abusive father, 70 surgeries, a failed Major League Baseball career, substance abuse, and even Parkinson's. He is truly a blessed man who was meant to move and inspire millions of people, and he has. After winning the Texas State Championship as a wingback, punter, and kicker for the legendary high school football coach, Gordon Wood, because they didn't have a high school baseball team, he finally achieved his dream of pitching in the minor leagues in the early 80s, but quickly retired after having a losing record and major arm surgeries that forced him to stop. Ten years later, Jim promised the high school baseball team he coached that he would try out again for the majors if they won the championship. So, at age 35, he did, and he was shocked to find out he was throwing at 98 and 99 miles per hour, 10 miles an hour faster than he ever did in his early 20s. His story was well known in all of baseball, and eventually Disney offered to bring it to the big screen. The star-studded, award-winning movie went on to make $100 million. So please join me now with The Rookie, Jim Morris. How fast were you sold 15 years ago? 85, 86, you just threw 98 miles an hour. No, but his journey was extraordinary. To Coach Jimmy Morris, the man who taught us about wanting something more. Dennis Quaid. Do you know how many guys can throw the ball 98 miles an hour? Not many. Well, hello, Jimmy Morris. Thank you for joining me on Virtually Speaking. How are you doing today, sir? Great, Chris. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. This is this is something I've been looking forward to for a while. I uh, really enjoy you, of course, as a speaker. Your message is awesome. You had a movie made about you. I mean, that is just as good as it gets. I've met several people who've had movies made about uh, them. And, um, you know, it just must be unbelievable to wake up every morning and know that there's that movie out there that uh, did over $100 million and Dennis Quaid played you. I mean, yeah. so let's start with that. It's kind of fun. You know, like, how did that happen? You uh, must have told the story to somebody and they loved it. I didn't tell the story to anybody. What happened was Mark Chiardi, one of the producers on the movie, worked out with Michael Eisner during lunch every day, and they saw me doing an interview in Durham, North Carolina. And he, he started calling me. He's like, dude, we want to make a movie. And I'm like, shut up, man. I'm 35. I'm, a, I'm an old man. I'm not a kid anymore. He goes, no, really, we want to do it. And I hung up on him twice. And then my agent at the time, Steve Canner, took over. And when I got called up, we went to Disney and they pitched a deal like exactly like I wanted. And they told me all these people wanted to play me and I was stunned. They're like, Matthew McConaughey, Brad Pitt. And I was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> and then Dennis Quaid signs on the movie. The day he signed on to the movie, I went to his house in Brentwood and I'm playing catch with a movie star in his front yard. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's pretty darn cool. And he did a great job, in, in my opinion. I mean, I know you. I didn't know you in those days, obviously, but um, I, I would guess that you were pleased with his performance and it was pretty true, true to a reality. It was, and John Lee Hancock, the director, and Dennis both asked me. Dennis actually told me, see, he said, if you see anything being filmed that you don't like or agree with, tell me and it's out. Wow. And they were true to their word and I was very happy with it. It's over 85% accurate. For Hollywood, that's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, Dennis, the third day on the set, he comes over and he goes, why aren't you smiling? And I'm like, because this is surreal. <laughs> he goes, this doesn't happen to everybody, man. Enjoy it. And then it was easy. And it's still surreal. I'm now 57 years old. And I look back at that, you know, 1999, 2000. And I'm like, what happened? They made a movie. It's just, it's really cool. Yeah, it's very, very cool. And it's such a great story. You know, I, 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 I realize now that obviously uh, you didn't have to tell that story. Yeah, because you were a big story in baseball. I think a lot of people, you know, were talking about the fact that this guy who was 35 years old 
uh, I think you were in your mid thirties and, and you, yeah. you, you know, decided that as a promise, I'm assuming the movie is correct as yes. a promise to your team, you were coaching, managing, uh, for in high school there in a small town in Texas, that if they got, if they won the district, um, that you would then, you know, uh, try out cause, cause they, they noticed you were throwing the ball pretty hard in practice. Well, they said I was throwing the ball hard. And when we made the bet, they couldn't hit me. By the end of the season, I couldn't get these high school kids out. 16 and 17 year old kids hitting me everywhere. And I'm like, there's no way I can go to a tryout. I'm getting lit up. And then I go to the tryout and they're like, you throw 98. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, when you hear that, man, woman, it doesn't matter. They go, you're throwing 98. There's a happy dance going on in your brain. Yeah. The second thing I thought was you've been throwing 98 miles an hour at high school kids. You're getting sued is what you're getting. And it, it was just really cool because right off the bat, Doug Gassaway, the scout, he goes, you're not 35 anymore. You're 32. <laughs> and I said, if I come back and try out, can I be 29? <laughs> and he started giggling. He goes, man, I remember you back at Ranger Junior College when you were skinny kid football star and everybody wanted to make a picture out of you. I said, yes, sir. He goes, I don't know what you've done your time off aside from eat. I'm like, thanks, dude. He <laughs> goes, but 94 was your first pitch without warming up. Then everything went up to 98. And I was absolutely stunned. I had a surgery and the doctor said, you will never, ever pitch again, physically impossible. And I threw like 88 then. 10 years go by. I'm throwing 98 when it's supposed to be impossible. And nothing's impossible, Chris. Yeah, that's one of the definite uh, takeaways and stories that that you that you share and lessons that you share with people. Um, there's so many aspects of your life that <laughs> that uh, we're going to get into that that have that as the punchline. You know, nothing is impossible. Um, but going back to the speed of the pitch in the movie, you stopped. Is this one of the 15 percent uh, fakers? Uh, Okay. Absolutely. Everybody's yeah. favorite part, the radar gun on the side of the road, man. But Dennis had a great time filming that scene and it let everybody know that I had no idea how hard I threw till I actually got to the tryout. Right. That's a great, yeah, that's, that, that was a good move. Whoever came up with that. And I bet that doctor who gave you the surgery that was supposed to make it so you could never pitch again. And instead he made you pitch faster. Uh, I I'm sure his business went through the roof after that. Right. <laughs> You know, it, it's amazing because after the movie came out, I go to Hawaii and I talk to all these surgeons and he was one of them. And I tell the story about, oh, you'll never pitch again. Yeah. And so the whole week I was there playing golf with everybody, they'd walk by Dr. Ryan and go, oh, he'll never pitch again. <laughs> it, it was just hysterical. And I had a lot of fun with that. Well, he could he could literally just say, you know, I make you pitch better, you know, and all the all the MLB should be going to him for surgeries because that's uh I don't even know if that's ever happened before. I've never heard of that where somebody pitches one speed and gives it up for years and years and comes back and pitches it six, seven, eight miles an hour faster. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. It, it was, it was a lot of fun. When I get to the tryout, nobody would even play catch with me to warm up. Yeah. And so I've got my kids there eight, four and one. And so we're playing games and I'm changing diapers and we're watching guys try out. And I'm like, what, what have I done to myself here? I made a promise and now I got to go through with it. Right. And it ended up being pretty cool. Yeah. That's, that's just such a great part of the movie too. And such a great part of the story. So going backwards a little bit further, obviously uh, the movie depicts you as a kid who just loved baseball and uh, really was pitching all the time into fences. Is that correct? Everywhere we went, my dad was in the military. He got transferred a lot. And I didn't talk a lot as a kid. He, children are to be seen and not heard. And so I didn't talk. I was scared to death. I mean, he's a big, scary guy. He didn't like me anyway. But <laughs> baseball was the one time in between those white lines that I could be the kid I was supposed to be. And the game coincides with life so much. It's like a chess match. I love the game. I always have. In Oakland, when we lived there, I watched Vita Blue. When we moved to Connecticut, it was Louis Tion. And it was just... It was my passion. It was my love. And I got to be the kid that I wanted to be. That's, that's great. And uh, yeah, you had a, you had a strained relationship with your dad <laughs> to say the least. Is that right? Uh, yeah. He's holding my little brother one day and he looks down at me and he goes, this is the one we wanted. We never wanted you. Really? And 
Yeah. Oh my and goodness. It was, we had to get married because of you. And it was just, it was. <laughs> were you the oldest? Like that. You were the oldest. I, I was the oldest. My little brother is the only sibling I had. He never did anything wrong. And I got in trouble for everything. And it was just pick on Jimmy. And I would hide under my bed to get away from my father. And, you know, it's amazing. One night he came in really late. He had been out with his buddies. And my German shepherd, Nick, was on the end of the bed. And I guess Nick sent something. And my dad opened the door to come in my room. My German shepherd took him down the stairs by his neck. And wow. the, the next day, my dog was gone. Oh, my God. So, but your dad, I, in the movie, it doesn't show him as a physically abusive guy. Physically and verbally abusive. It was not the message we wanted to convey. I could have put all that in there if I went with a different studio. But this was a movie I wanted. And we chose Disney because it's about the kids who everybody counted out from the beginning, who right. overcame incredible odds. It's also about the old fat guy who got a second chance at a dream that he messed up when he was young and supposed to be talented. And so Disney did a great job with that. Yeah. And the relationship with my dad is something I can talk about in my speeches and people gravitate towards that. I've had so many people come up crying and bawling going, I think your dad was my dad. Yeah. And, you know, just a lot of shared tears together. Did your dad get to see the movie? I don't know if he ever saw the movie or not. I did give him the ball. He did show up at the ballpark in Arlington and I gave him the ball. Jose right. Canseco was standing right next to me, as was Roberto Hernandez. And so I gave him the ball. So, so I, I again, the movie depicts one thing and, you know, uh, it's different in real life. Um, so, so really, you just you kind of really weren't talking much in the in the in the later part of his life. We didn't talk much. I tried to repair the relationship. My pastor, who married my wife and I, he said, you don't have to count people out. You just rearrange the order in which you talk to them. He goes, take him out from up here and put him down here. Right. Because every time you do that, it's a negative. And so I went back to him right. and I apologize. This is my last interaction with my dad. My grandmother, 98 years old, passes away. I go to her funeral. Right. We're in the church. I go up and put my arm on my dad. And I said, I am so sorry. And he looked up at me. He said, don't ever effing talk to me again. What? That was, a, that was the last time I talked to him. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That did not come through that bad, that it was that bad of a relationship in the movie. And, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's tough to hear, of course. So obviously there were no apologies from his side. And, any, uh, it's never as bad as you thought. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, uh, there's something with, within you that, that, that really pushed you to be a great man regardless. And, and I'm sure with your own kids, you wanted to, do a better job. <laughs> I learned how not to parent from my parents. I learned to parent from my grandparents who I lived with from 15 to 18. Mm -hmm. And they taught me about life. They taught me to be a good man. They taught me to be a good husband. They taught me about life. They taught me about faith. They taught me about a sense of humor. And it was fun listening to them tell stories with their friends of every World War II, something we've never had to see or go through in our lifetime but our grandfathers did and don't even want to talk about what they went through. And we don't want to know. Yeah. But to come back with that sense of humor and be able to talk about life stories and go through the depression and come out on the other side of it and work your rear end off to get to be where it is you want to be. They set the standard for us in this country, how to work hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's very well said. Um, you know, uh, so to just recap the story, because I'm realizing that not everybody necessarily has seen the movie <laughs> or knows the exact story, but obviously you loved, you loved baseball. Uh, you moved around a lot. And then the town you ended up in in Texas really was very small. Uh, he was there for his military job and uh, you wanted to play baseball. And I guess you really weren't able to join a team there uh, and play much. Is that right? Or do, how did that work out with the baseball community there in the town? My dad was stationed in Hollywood, Florida at the time. And I was the second freshman ever to make the varsity baseball team at MacArthur High School in Hollywood. Two weeks after the season starts, right. 
my dad said, guess what? You're going to live with my parents. And I thought, wow, they came, he came from somewhere. What is this going to be like? <laughs> and when I walked into my grandparents' house, I had two rules. If you do it, own it, own it, live up to it, move on. And number two, tell the truth. If you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said because the truth is the truth. Yeah. And that was it. That was their standard for me. And they expected me to live up to expectation, not to live down to expectation. But when I moved to a high school in which our football coach, because it's Texas, <laughs> hated baseball. I'd rather watch grass grow is what I'd rather do. <laughs> and so we didn't have a high school team. I played summer right. ball, 10, 10 games a summer, and that was it. Okay. And so that's kind of where it ended, right? You, you didn't, weren't able to pursue it at that point anymore. Well, my grandfather got sick with ALS, some chemical he picked up during World War II. And as he got sicker, I wanted to stay close to home. I graduated from high school. I didn't want to play football. My high school football coach was furious. You'll never make it in baseball. You're a football player. But I want to do it my way. I went to junior college. And for four months, I went to Ranger Junior College. And my grandfather got really sick. Then he was in the hospital. And then in November of 1982, he passed away. And I have to say that I've never seen a funeral that large in my life. People came from all over the country to pay their respects to a man they know lived for other people. Yeah. And what is cool about that is one of the people who would come into the store was Gene Autry, come in from California to hang out with my grandfather. It was the most incredible thing. And then to find out Dennis Quaid plays me in the movie, Dennis is related to Gene Autry. And so this is a small world, man. Wow. And Dennis knew that? Did he find that out? We found that out while we were filming. It was pretty cool. Wow. That's so awesome. So anyway, you end up being a high school uh, baseball coach and uh, you, you still have a passion for the game and your kids are not doing well. There's not really a real baseball program or field and uh, football is everything in Texas. And and then they uh, they get you to make that promise because they see how hard you're pitching and they love you because you live for others like your grandpa taught you. And then you had to go face the music and go to the go to the tryouts. So then you miraculously in your mind, you get this phone call that uh, <laughs> that you're going to be uh, on the team. The, the, the Devil Rays are picking you up, putting you in triple A's. So you go to work out there, you go to play for them. It's not going very well. Right at the beginning. You know, they had me come back for a second tryout to see if I could throw that harder if my arm fell off. <laughs> so I'm I'm throwing in the rain. It's raining so hard that I'm they had, have to give me a brand new baseball every single pitch. Sliding up to my knee in mud, 98 every pitch again. My kids are there. Half my baseball team is there. And then they send me to Florida at rehab. And to get well from injuries and surgeries, they sent me there to lose famous Amos cookies and Dr. Peppers. And when you're a coach, you have a different diet than when you're a player. Yeah. And I thought I was there to play. They thought I was there to train for a marathon race. I Got lost it. 30 pounds in three weeks. Go meet the double A team on the road. Um, first night I come in with a guy on first before I ever throw a pitch. And this is funny because I'm a coach. Before I ever throw a pitch, I balk. And the guy goes from first to second. And I'm like, I just sit there and laugh. And Ray Searage, our pitching coach, who pitched in the big leagues, he, he calls time. He, what are you laughing about? <laughs> I said, I coached this stuff and I just did it. <laughs> you don't ever do that. And he started laughing. Then we're laughing. And the umpire comes up. We tell him. He starts laughing. Right. And I pick him off. I get a guy. I strike a guy out 91, 92 miles an hour. Throw the second night in double A. Throw two innings. Strike out five guys. 98, 99 miles an hour. Next day, I'm in triple A. And for two months, I'm watching guys on their way up, on their way down, and guys just trying to hold on a little bit longer. And I'm getting to be a kid again at 35. I'm getting the chance that I should have given myself when I was 19. But when you're 19, you know it all. And you're like, I'll take this for granted. I deserve this. They're going to give everything to me. And then all of a sudden, you're out of the game. And then you get that second chance to go back. And you want to do it right. First one to the ballpark, last one to leave. I got to hang out with fantastic ball players, and it was a true pleasure. And I had a lot of fun doing that. So then uh, you ended up uh, kind of almost giving up in the movie. Yeah. And you're about to go home, and you're like, I don't want to. I'm not. This is not going anywhere for me, honey. And she says, Stay on the road for another month. Give it another month. And then 
something happens. What was it that happened that that kind of sparked you? It felt like in the movie you had a spark that came from somewhere and you went out there and was it the joy of, of the game and, and really just kind of remembering how, how you felt as a kid again? The joy came from going to a little league ball game one mm. night and watching those kids have fun playing for a hot dog and a Coke and remembering back to when I was that age and the joy I found the passion that I had for the game. And so that, that spurred me on. And so I stuck it out and I got called up and it was incredible. And, you know, I go to the ballpark in Arlington where the devil rays are, they're playing the Rangers before I can ever go in the clubhouse. I have to sign a contract. Right. So I'm part of the team so I can go in. I walk in, there's Wade Boggs who just gotten his 3000th hit automatic hall of famer. And I'm still a coach and a fan. I'm, I look at him, I go, <laughs> you're Wade Boggs. You like chicken. And he starts laughing at me. He goes, man, that is the best story I've ever heard in my life. They've heard about me for three months. But Roberto Hernandez, Fred McGriff, another great guy, just Jose Canseco. And he has this persona of being this big, bad dude. He's really, really nice and down to earth. And it's just, a, it's a lot of fun. And I'm getting to hang out with big league ball players. And you are a big leaguer now, you know? I'm getting that chance to pitch against guys who are the best in the world. And I have fun doing it. So then what happened? You ended up uh, getting hurt. So you came to LA, saw a doctor. What happened then? Um, the Devil Rays weren't happy with the fact that I wanted to go to my original doctor who did Tommy John, Dr. Frank Job. And Dr. Job said, you need to have your elbow tightened. Are you sure you want to keep pursuing the game? I said, yes, sir. And so Dr. Elatrosh did the surgery while Dr. Job looked over his shoulder <laughs> and the first time I had Tommy John, I was in the hospital for five days in 1986. The second time I was in the hospital for four hours, I was having lunch with my agent in Santa Monica at noon. It was the, the most mind boggling thing on earth. And I got in shape again. Double race cut me because I didn't like the doctor I went to. Dr. Job told the Dodgers about me and they signed me to a contract in 2001. True Hollywood story. <laughs> Incredible. And just. If I had not made that bet with those kids, I would not be where I was. And that's because of them. When I pushed them, they pushed me back and we made each other better. But if it wasn't for your grandfather, who really took you in and showed you how to be a father and how to be a human being, you wouldn't have emulated him as a coach and they wouldn't have loved you the way they did. Cause I don't think a lot of teams go to bat for their coach. Uh, like they did. Yeah. They really believed in you and and seemed like they loved you. And and uh, that's not very, very normal, I don't think, uh, in sports. So that shows that, it, in my opinion, it wasn't them. It was you. You know, they, they gave you back what you gave them. And they, yeah. they, they believed in you and they saw something in you that was great. So that's a beautiful story. And then you were with the Dodgers and uh something happened that yeah. kind of scared you right what was it i go to chavez ravine to work out during the winter and i'm at dr job's three days a week i go out to stadium four days a week and i'm doing interviews and i'm basically hitting running fielding pitching doing all the things that a major league ball player does and i'm doing fantastic and i'm in shape and i'm doing great and then in five days, I went from LA home to see my kids then to Florida where the Dodgers still had spring training. And something happened in those five days to where I couldn't judge a ball being thrown at me or hit at me. I couldn't bunt, I couldn't hit. All of a sudden my balance was off and I, I was actually scared to stand up there and throw a hundred miles an hour at guys who could hit it back at me 120. Right. And I thought this is not good. And I told him, you know what? My arm hurts. Cause I don't want to go, Hey, I don't know what's going on, but my mind is all wiggly and I'm losing balance. I don't know what's going on. Right. It took another 10 years to get the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Wow. Why did it take 10 years? We go to different doctors. They had different things. What it came oh. down to was this neurologist who said, you know what? She stood behind me. She's like 4'11". She stood behind me and she touched my shoulder and pulled me back towards her very lightly. She's 4'11". I fell on her and almost smushed her against the door. Oh, wow. And 
she goes, we're going to do a brain scan. And so I had to go drink this ra radiation fluid that yeah. they give you this green garbage. And then they did a test on my brain and said, you have no dopamine on the right side of your brain. And they sent me to one of the world renowned people, uh, Dr. Yankovic in Houston. He diagnosed me with CTE induced Parkinson's, which means I had too many concussions playing football Ooh. in high school and college. Wow. And he puts me on the medication. Medication works. I can smell, I can taste the one problem with it. It made my stomach stop working. And so then I have gastric bypass and then I have a deep brain stimulator put in. So, because I couldn't tolerate the medicine. And so when the doctor, my neurosurgeon here in San Antonio, he put the deep brain stimulator in. When I woke up, I could smell what my wife had brought into the room for dinner that night. And I was shocked. I was like, and I didn't even tell her. I'm like, she's having Italian food. And then she pulled it out and it was lasagna. I'm like, I can smell. That is incredible. And I uh -huh. was just very, for the first time in 10 years, I was like, I had the answer and this is it. And this is going to work. My balance is great. I can smell, I can taste, I can move. This is awesome. And so when we found out the diagnosis, my wife and I, we sat there and cried and it wasn't because we were sad. It was relief because wow, now, now we, we know what we're fighting. And so I had a neurologist, the neurosurgeon put the deep brain stimulator in, the neurologist adjusted it for me. And every time I would go in, there would be a new symptom. And she's like, this is just Parkinson's. This is how it is. Yeah. You're just going to get sicker and sicker and sicker. Eventually, uh, my wife, Shauna, had to start traveling with me on the road because I couldn't even button my dress shirts to go downstairs and do speeches. And so she's buttoning my buttons and doing all this stuff. And I'm sleeping every moment I can because... Parkinson's people have horrible nightmares, they're insomniacs, and all this was attacking me, and I'm still going to speeches, and I'm knocking it out of the park, but my private life is a train wreck, man, and it just looks like I'm fading quickly, and opiates for 20 years, because 70 surgeries, you're on it before, on it during, on it after, I never abused them, but I took them. But that didn't work. I was still in pain. So what do you do? Well, I'm a doctor because I've got a bachelor's of science degree. And so I added vodka to that mix. And that didn't work out for me very well. And it actually, it ended me up in rehab. And I think in rehab for the first time in 20 years, I got to concentrate on myself and who I really wanted to be. Hmm. And it was 30 days of the most cleansing time I've ever had in my life. And I turned, I flipped a switch one day. And for people with faith, they'll get this. The, my guidance counselor there, uh, he brought me in his office. He loves baseball. He has mementos from every stadium. He's been to every stadium yeah. and gotten something. And he goes, love the story. Dennis did a great job. Why are you here? And I told him, and he goes, wow, that's, I can see how you set yourself up for that. You isolated yourself and separated yourself from the world. I wasn't trying to kill myself, but I quit living. The only thing I did was show up to speeches. I would do them and then I would get out. And the pain was so bad that I'm taking my pills and I'm drinking vodka. And that flipped a switch for me when he talked to me. And four and a half years, no pills, no vodka, no drinking at all. And I don't miss it. And during that period of time also, you know, four years ago, my mom bought me a cane to walk around the block. <laughs> then all of a sudden things start happening, happening and I start turning the deep brain stimulator down a little bit at a time. Mm. And I'm still healthy and I still smell, I still taste. I'm like, what is going on? Eventually I turned it off and I was perfectly fine. My dog got under my feet. I didn't fall to the ground, stumbling over him. And all of a sudden I had balance and I had all these attributes back and I'm like wow I could do this I started running I started lifting weights I turned my deep brain stimulator off my neurosurgeon said let's leave it in for a year and then if you're doing well we'll take it out well we waited two years and then during COVID which everybody hated because everybody got scared in the world 
Right. The one surgery I had was my neurosurgeon took the deep brain stimulator out and he said, he goes, I know you have faith. He said, I do too. And you can't got out, count God out from anything. And he took it out and I've been fine and healthy since. I run five to seven miles a day. I lift every day and I'm just blessed. I, I haven't gotten out on the road very much. I've done a lot of virtual talks. And so basically yeah. I'm ready to get back out and talk to people in person. <laughs> but this, this is, is all just, new. This is all this, stuff that's, I mean, the story continues. I mean, this, I didn't realize the rehab and the taking the, the deep brain stimulator out um, just happened the last couple of years. That's, that's amazing. So you're healthier and in better shape mentally and, mentally with, and, and with addiction than you've yeah. ever been in your life just in the last couple of years. COVID yeah. all, almost, you know, kind of, hell, uh, kind of had to make you feel like, man, I, I feel so great. I want to get out there and live life. And now I got to sit home more and, you know, uh, you know, take myself out of the mix. But um, everybody had to do that. And now yeah. uh, it looks like everybody's able to start opening up and um, start living again. And you're ready to go. I mean, this is just absolutely an, an unbelievable story. And so when people go, what is it you did? I don't know. I don't know that I deserved it. It just happened. Yeah. I've been, I've been lucky twice. We can overcome so much more than what we give ourselves credit for. Yeah. But we stop, we get scared and we stop what we're doing and we just fall in line with everybody else. Well, I'll tell you what, chronic illness doesn't know color, doesn't know sex, doesn't care if you're gay, straight or anything else. If it's going to be crying, it's coming after you, you got it. The other thing, addiction, same thing. The rich, poor, black, white, it doesn't matter. It gets people. I saw people of all types and all kinds in rehab and were there together. And you know what? We all got along. And we're all trying to overcome something again. And it's just, it's refreshing to me. And people go, wow, you went to rehab. You know what? Best thing I ever did in my life. A lot of people went to rehab and nothing changed. A lot of people have been to rehab many times and nothing changed. Many times, yeah. But, you know, what I'm getting from this, Jim, is that you're blessed. And you were meant to touch millions of people with your story through the movie and through the speaking because, you know, two things that usually don't happen, happen. You got rid of Parkinson's, it seems yeah. like, it looks like. It's, a, it's amazing. It's a miracle. And you also could throw six to 10 miles an hour faster than you used to be able to, you know, 10 Absolutely. years later. So these are, these are, uh, these are, these are extraordinary events and, and you're obviously blessed. And I believe in that. Well, I'll tell and you this, Chris, when I went back to the neurologist, she had me do all these physical tests and I passed everything. She said, this is not possible. And so she sent me to do the brain scan again. So I drank the fluid, did the brain scan. She goes, your dopamine levels are perfect. This doesn't happen. What happened to you? Right. And you know what? What happened happened. And we can overcome more than we give ourselves credit for. We just have to be willing to go out and do something. You have a dream. You make an action plan and you go out. You plan your work and work your plan, man. That's what you do. Amazing. Well, you know, obviously you uh, believe in yourself. Um, you have faith. I know that, which has been helpful to you. And um, uh, it's just an unbelievable, awesome story that has so many different parts to it that can touch so many different people. I mean, people with issues with their parents, with their families, uh, people learning to be great, you know, getting to be the best at what they do. Um, and then, of course, dealing with the addiction and then dealing with the chronic illness. I mean, you uh, you have a lot to tell and, and a lot of great outcomes to share. And uh, man, it's just so inspiring. So I have had I have had such a great time hanging out with you. And I always do talking to you and hanging out. You're one of my favorites. I, I know you're down there in Texas having a good time, but you're ready to move and uh, yeah. see the rest of the country. I'm looking forward to seeing you when you're back here in Los Angeles. Yes, sir. But uh, Thank you so much for coming on. This has been a true pleasure. Absolutely, Chris. Great catching up with you. Thank you, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.